This is Location-Based AR for Social Justice, Case Studies, Lessons, and Open Challenges. This case study is a tale of two projects that used augmented reality to interrogate public monuments in ways that are impossible in physical mediums alone. The first project in our tale of two projects is Dear Visitor, which centered around the conspicuous absence of a monument, which was installed by the end of our project, as you can see on the right. The Charleston Reconstructed Project, on the other hand, which used AR to interrogate Confederate monuments, centered around the conspicuous presence of a monument, which was gone by the time our project ended. Charleston Reconstructed was a project funded by the Brown Institute for Media Innovation in 2018. Dear Visitor started as a prototype for the Charleston project. It centered around using AR to install the voice of Chanel Miller, a sexual assault survivor, in the site of her assault on Stanford campus after a real physical plaque featuring her words had been delayed for years. We'll next show you a walkthrough of what the Dear Visitor app looked like. This was the entry screen. Then you'd be able to see a plaque featuring Chanel Miller's words on site. You took away my worth, my intimacy, my confidence, my own voice until today. You could see floating letters above. And every time you tapped on a letter, you'd be able to hear the voice of a activist uh, who worked on the site or a former student. We were able to dovetail with years of activist effort at the time that she released her memoir. So we were featured in global news all over, which really helped bring attention to the issue of the plaque. And finally, after several years of delay, the plaque was installed. But the crazy thing was that the digital design that we had in our app was actually the one that was instantiated in physical space, which was not our intention in the beginning. Next, I'll kick it over to Rob. In Charleston, South Carolina's most central square, there's a statue of former Vice President John C. Calhoun, who defended slavery. And that's a common problem in public spaces across the United States. So we created an augmented reality app, in this case, to contextualize and reimagine the monuments in Charleston Central Square, which is called Marion Square. And the app had three chapters. The uh, first chapter used AR to digitally alter a monument directly. Uh, the second chapter recreated an existing monument of Denmark Vesey, a slave who plotted a rebellion. The third chapter created a digital monument from scratch that represented a shared set of stories, hopes, and values. And through the app, users heard audio from historians and community stakeholders to consider the existing narrative represented by the park's monuments and also to think about a counter narrative focusing on the contributions of Black Charlestonians. So ultimately, when everything came together. But where you place it, how big is it? You're sending messages. In 2019, we organized a beta test of our experience in Charleston, where we got valuable feedback from participants, but our plans for a wider public release were disrupted by unforeseen events in 2020. The global pandemic halted travel plans and then the killing of George Floyd sparked a nationwide reckoning with racism and police violence. And in response, the city's mayor ordered the removal of the Calhoun statue from Marion Square. It was the landmark that our experience was built around. And although that was a celebratory outcome, it also meant that doing a public launch of the project would have required pretty much rethinking the whole thing. And so it was never actually launched in full. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the learnings that we had uh, based on both of the projects. First, we want to talk about the idea of connecting content in place. We found that the most impactful moments occurred because the digital content had a reason to be experienced in a specific physical location. For Dear Visitor, the digital plaque, which is circled on the left, was instantiated in the very garden where a physical plaque was supposed to be. For Charleston Reconstructed, this was digitally instantiating the Denmark Vesey statue, which is circled on the right, in a physical location where the real statue was originally supposed to be. In both cases, placing the digital contents elsewhere would have made them lose context. Besides the digital content, another way we connected content in place was to prompt interviewees about the physical space. In Dear Visitor, we framed every interview with the following. What would you like future visitors to the space to know? I think before term started, like I was in my room and I heard male students basically like talking about their like sexual exploits in the garden. The interviews often start with very specific anecdotes about the space which helps users feel a greater sense of connection with the content. 
This is also a key decision that helped us make very difficult editorial choices. Content which was important but less critical to be experienced in the space itself would be instead hosted on a website. Another learning we had was that users needed clear instructions to understand how to use the app, especially because it involved them using the technology while they navigated physical space. So during the Charleston Reconstructed beta test, we had to give verbal instructions or borrow users' tablets to help them start the first chapter successfully. We solved that by creating a prologue that taught them how to do the basic actions that would be needed for the rest of the experience. Despite improving that onboarding experience, we found that having human facilitators was still crucial to the success of the user experience. And ultimately, this made it easier for them to engage with the content. There was also an added benefit that was specific to the content of both projects. Social justice projects in contested spaces like this are charged by nature, and we found that it was better for people to process all of what they were experiencing in a form of community. We've also come away with a number of design learnings around attention and ergonomics of location-based AR. Picture standing under the sweltering Charleston sun during the summer, with the sun glaring off the iPad screen and having to hold up the device for minutes at a time. It's not a very comfortable environment. And so to keep this in check, we have a few suggestions. Keep the experience under five minutes. The ideal length of an AR experience is surprisingly short. We tried longer experiences to capture all the information, but this was not an ideal user experience. Second, public spaces have a lot of distractions. So we used ambient music to help keep users focused. Third, we kept closed captioning optional because users often default to reading text instead of engaging with their environment. And last, we kept content at or near eye level. The field of view of devices are often very small, so it's hard to discover content away from eye level. And it also presents a challenge for users who have to hold up devices for a long time. I'm Koi, and uh, I'm here to chat about kind of what can the future um, hold for us. So first, we're going to talk about uh, trading off availability for quality. Uh, a lot of people ask, hey, can I do this on my phone, on my own? Is it on the App Store? Um, we actually never posted either of these experiences on the App Store because the topics were so heavy that they required this human facilitation and offboarding that Rob mentioned earlier for um, proper processing. And then number two is just that visibility on small phone screens was a very poor experience of the AR elements. So we decided to uh, stick with I iPads. Uh, a way to solve this could be to partner with a local museum or organization to host these experiences with the right hardware and the right human facilitation uh, to deliver a high quality experience. The next challenge was uh, anchoring. Four years ago, image tracking was the best solution for us in an outdoor setting where the lighting conditions were variable. Uh, for Dear Visitor, we had to bring our own marker to the garden because there was no markings in the garden. Uh, for Charleston, we were able to use an existing on-site marker. Uh, there was a little sign that said climbing is prohibited at the base of the statue that we anchored our experience on. Uh, we're really excited for folks to discover better ways for devices to have stabler uh, anchoring in outdoor conditions um, through computer vision research and other types of research that would unlock this type of anchoring. A uh, really difficult challenge is that we ran into is the Calhoun Monument came down. Um, intervention designers need to be hyper aware of the way the space they're working in may change over the course uh, of their project. Um, and then engineers need to be aware of how you know, software updates to iOS and Unity have made our project incompatible with newer devices. So uh, how can we future-proof uh, technology for the longevity of these projects? So as you could hear from Koi, timing was a big factor in both projects. Um, ideally, your project would be resilient to shifting environments and to shifting software. For projects that are about current events, timing related to these events can be really difficult. For projects about current events in physical space, the timing can change even more because of extreme weather, because of pandemics that halt travel to physical sites, and because of statues coming down. On the horizon, we think there's some exciting progress that we can link together to make XR experiences in physical space even better. This happened just a few weeks ago. I was in California and I saw the Comfort Women Memorial in San Francisco. And I noticed that on my iPhone, it linked an identification of the landmark, external knowledge from Wikipedia, and related photos from the web, all right in my pocket without me prompting it. 
We couple this with the fact that anyone can design monuments now. So on the left, we have a couple of monument designs using stable diffusion. And on the right, we have the dream fusion text to 3D model from Google. And I created these three point clouds in 30 seconds using point E from Hugging Face. These are very quick prototypes of what monuments could be. But if you're able to design anything, then you could create a monument of a Confederate soldier or a civil rights hero. In a world where anyone can design anything, who will curate in digital space and in physical space? Identifying stakeholders and power brokers in these decisions is critical, especially as the technology rapidly develops. In conclusion, we talked about two projects. One, where we visualized a monument that wasn't there. The second, where we interrogated a monument that was there. Finally, a monument was built and a monument came down. Thanks so much for listening to our insights and we hope you'll stay in contact.